Lesson 13 Wait on the Lord Sabbath afternoon, March 23 Remember that prayer is the source of your strength. A worker cannot gain success while he hurries through his prayers and rushes away to look after something that he fears may be neglected or forgotten. He gives only a few hurried thoughts to God. He does not take time to think, to pray, to wait upon the Lord for a renewal of physical and spiritual strength. He soon becomes weary. He does not feel the uplifting, inspiring influence of God's Spirit. He is not quickened by fresh life. His jaded frame and tired brain are not soothed by personal contact with Christ. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and He shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Psalm 27 verse 14 and Lamentations chapter 3 verse 26. There are those who work all day and far into the night to do what seems to them must be done. The Lord looks pityingly upon these weary, heavy-laden burden-bearers and says to them, Come unto me, and I will give you rest. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 7, page 243. Let us each wait on the Lord, and He will teach us how to labor. He will reveal to us the work that we are best adapted to perform. This will not lead men to start out in an independent spirit, to promulgate new theories. In this time when Satan is seeking to make void the law of God through the exaltation of false science, we need to guard most carefully against everything that would tend to lessen our faith and scatter our forces. As laborers together with God, we should be in harmony with the truth and with our brethren. There should be counsel and cooperation. Even in the midst of the great deceptions of the last days, when delusive miracles will be performed in the sight of men in behalf of satanic theories, it is our privilege to hide ourselves in Christ Jesus. It is possible for us to seek and to obtain salvation. And in this time of unusual peril, we must learn to stand alone, our faith fixed, not on the word of man, but on the sure promises of God. Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 490. Many, even in their seasons of devotion, fail of receiving the blessing of real communion with God. They are in too great haste. With hurried steps they press through the circle of Christ's loving presence, pausing perhaps a moment within the sacred precincts, but not waiting for counsel. They have no time to remain with the Divine Teacher. With their burdens they return to their work. Not a pause for a moment in His presence, but personal contact with Christ to sit down in companionship with Him. This is our need. The Faith I Live By, page 225 Sunday, March 24 the Call of Waiting Wait on the Lord, and again I say, wait on the Lord. We may ask of the human agents and not receive. We may ask of God, and He says, Ye shall receive. Therefore you know to whom to look. You know in whom to trust. You must not trust in man or make flesh your arm. Lean as heavily as you please upon the Mighty One who hath said, Let him take hold of my strength, that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. Then wait and watch and pray and work, keeping your face constantly turned to the Son of Righteousness. Let the bright beams from the face of Jesus shine into your hearts to shine upon others through you. Ye are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew chapter 5 verses 14 to 16. We must lift up Jesus before the people. Reflecting Christ, page 119. We may bring him our little cares and perplexities as well as our greater troubles. Whatever arises to disturb or distress us, we should take it to the Lord in prayer. Calmly, 
yet fervently, the soul is to reach out after God, and sweet and abiding will be the influence emanating from him who sees in secret, whose ear is open to the prayer arising from the heart. He who in simple faith holds communion with God will gather to himself divine rays of light to strengthen and sustain him in the conflict with Satan. If we keep the Lord ever before us, allowing our hearts to go out in thanksgiving and praise to him, we shall have a continual freshness in our religious life. Our prayers will take the form of a conversation with God as we would talk with a friend. He will speak his mysteries to us personally. Often there will come to us a sweet, joyful sense of the presence of Jesus. Prayer turns aside the attacks of Satan. The Faith I Live By, page 225. After the prayer is made, if the answer is not realized immediately, do not weary of waiting and become unstable. Waver not. Cling to the promise. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Like the importunate widow, urge your case, being firm in your purpose. Is the object important and of great consequence to you? It certainly is. Then waver not, for your faith may be tried. If the thing you desire is valuable, it is worthy of a strong, earnest effort. You have the promise. Watch and pray. Be steadfast and the prayer will be answered. For is it not God who has promised? If it costs you something to obtain it, you will prize it the more when obtained. You are plainly told that if you waver, you need not think that you shall receive anything of the Lord. A caution is here given not to become weary, but to rest firmly upon the promise. If you ask, he will give you liberally and upbraid not. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, page 131. Monday, March 25. Peace of a Weaned Child. We are not always to remain children in our knowledge and experience in spiritual things. We are not always to express ourselves in the language of one who has just received Christ. But our prayers and exhortations are to grow in intelligence as we advance in experience and the truth. When the last great day shall be ushered in, and we shall see what we might have attained had we taken advantage of the helps that heaven vouchsafed to us, when we see how we might have grown in grace and look upon these things as God looks upon them, seeing what we have lost by failing to grow up into the full stature of men and women in Christ, we shall wish that we had been more in earnest. The Lord desires you to understand the position you occupy as sons and daughters of the Most High, children of the Heavenly King. Sons and Daughters of God, page 330. The germination of the seed represents the beginning of spiritual life, and the development of the plant is a beautiful figure of Christian growth. As in nature, so in grace. There can be no life without growth. The plant must either grow, or die. As its growth is silent and imperceptible, but continuous, so is the development of the Christian life. At every stage of development, our life may be perfect, yet if God's purpose for us is fulfilled, there will be continual advancement. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. As our opportunities multiply, our experience will enlarge and our knowledge increase we shall become strong to bear responsibility and our maturity will be in proportion to our privileges. The plant grows by receiving that which God has provided to sustain its life. It sends down its roots into the earth. It drinks in the sunshine, the dew, and the rain. It receives the life-giving properties from the air. So the Christian is to grow by cooperating with the divine agencies. Feeling our helplessness, we are to improve all the opportunities granted us to gain a fuller experience. As the plant takes root in the soil, so we are to take deep root in Christ. Christ's Object Lessons, pages 65 and 66. 
God brings his people near him by close testing trials, by showing them their own weakness and inability, and by teaching them to lean upon him as their only help and safeguard. Then his object is accomplished. They are prepared to be used in every emergency, to fill important positions of trust, and to accomplish the grand purposes for which their powers were given them. God takes men upon trial. He proves them on the right hand and on the left, and thus they are educated, trained, disciplined. Jesus, our Redeemer, man's representative and head, endured this testing process. He suffered more than we can be called upon to suffer. And now, relying on the merits of our overcomer, we may become victors in his name. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 86. Tuesday, March 26. Bringing in the Sheaves. If the chosen messengers of the Lord should wait for every obstacle to be moved out of their way, many never would go to search for the scattered sheep. Satan will present many objections in order to keep them from duty, but they will have to go out by faith, trusting in him who has called them to his work, and he will open the way before them, as far as it will be for their good and his glory. Jesus, the great teacher and pattern, had not where to lay his head. His life was one of toil, sorrow, and suffering. He then gave himself for us. Those who, in Christ's stead, beseech souls to be reconciled to God and who hope to reign with Christ in glory must expect to be partakers of his sufferings here. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Psalm 126, verses 5 and 6. Early Writings, page 63. Many times we, James and Ellen White, are disappointed in our expectations, but then when we see the Lord working with our efforts and souls coming to Christ, we forget the weariness, disappointments, and trials which we meet in connection with this work and feel honored of God to be permitted to have a part in it. We have had some very precious seasons of prayer with some who were discouraged and almost in despair. We rejoiced with them as light shone into the darkened chambers of the soul. The Lord has indeed encouraged our hearts and strengthened us for our great work. We do believe fruit will abound to the glory of God as the result of this meeting. Let your prayers that God would bring souls who are in the darkness of error to the knowledge of the truth. Light, precious light, is shining on every page of the Word of God. It is the man of our counsel. When we study its pages with a heartfelt desire to learn our duty, angels are close beside us to impress the mind and strengthen the imagination to discern the sacred things revealed in the Word of God. This Day with God, page 174. It is God in whom we must trust. God has the world in his hand. We have God on our side. All heaven is waiting and longing for our cooperation. The Lord is supreme. Why then should we fear? The Lord is almighty. Why should we tremble? In the past, God has delivered his people, and he will be our helper if we will arise in his strength and go forward. Let us work as we have never done before. Let us put self aside and lay hold of Jesus Christ by faith. Let us reveal him to the world as the one altogether lovely and the chiefest among ten thousand. That I may know him, page 342. Wednesday, March 27. Waiting in God's Sabbath Rest. Since the Sabbath is the memorial of creative power, it is the day above all others when we should acquaint ourselves with God through His works. In the minds of the children, the very thought of the Sabbath should be bound up with the beauty of natural things. 
Happy is the family who can go to the place of worship on the Sabbath as Jesus and his disciples went to the synagogue, across the fields, along the shores of the lake, or through the groves. Happy the father and mother who can teach their children God's written word with illustrations from the open pages of the book of nature, who can gather under the green trees in the fresh pure air to study the word and to sing the praise of the father above. Education, page 251. Heaven's work never ceases, and men should never rest from doing good. The Sabbath is not intended to be a period of useless inactivity. The law forbids secular labor on the rest day of the Lord. The toil that gains a livelihood must cease. No labor for worldly pleasure or profit is lawful upon that day. But as God ceased his labor of creating and rested upon the Sabbath and blessed it, so man is to leave the occupations of his daily life and devote those sacred hours to healthful rest, to worship, and to holy deeds. The work of Christ in healing the sick was in perfect accord with the law. It honored the Sabbath. The Desire of Ages, page 207. The sanctification set forth in the scriptures embraces the entire being, spirit, soul, and body. Paul prayed for the Thessalonians that their whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Again he writes to believers, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. In the time of ancient Israel, every offering brought as a sacrifice to God was carefully examined. If any defect was discovered in the animal presented, it was refused, for God had commanded that the offering be without blemish. So Christians are bidden to present their bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. In order to do this, all their powers must be preserved in the best possible condition. Every practice that weakens physical or mental strength unfits man for the service of his Creator. And will God be pleased with anything less than the best we can offer? Said Christ, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Those who do love God with all the heart will desire to give Him the best service of their life, and they will be constantly seeking to bring every power of their being into harmony with the laws that will promote their ability to do His will. The Great Controversy, page 473. Thursday, March 28. Joy comes in the morning. When the light of heaven shines upon the human agent, his countenance will express the joy of the Lord within. It is the absence of Christ from the soul that makes people sad and of a doubtful mind. It is the want of Christ that makes the countenance sad, and their life is a pilgrimage of sighs. Rejoicing is the very keynote of the word of God for all who receive him. Why? Because they have the light of life. Light brings gladness and joy, and that joy is expressed in the life and the character. Ellen White comments in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1144. Faith in God's love and overruling providence lightens the burdens of anxiety and care. It fills the heart with joy and contentment in the highest or the lowliest lot. Religion tends directly to promote health, to lengthen life, and to heighten our enjoyment of all its blessings. It opens to the soul a never-failing fountain of happiness. Would that all who have not chosen Christ might realize that He has something vastly better to offer them that they are seeking for themselves. The path of transgression leads to misery and destruction, but wisdom's ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 17. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 600. What a change was wrought in the hearts of the disciples as they looked once more on the loved countenance of their master. Luke chapter 24, verse 32. They had been witness to the wisdom and power of God, and they were persuaded that neither death, 
nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature would be able to separate them from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. Saith the Lord, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Psalm 30, verse 5. When on his resurrection day these disciples met the Savior, and their hearts burned within them as they listened to his words, when they looked upon the head and hands and feet that had been bruised for them, when before his ascension Jesus led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands in blessing bade them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, adding, Lo, I am with you alway, Mark chapter 16 verse 15 and Matthew chapter 28 verse 20, then, even though, like his, their pathway led through sacrifice and martyrdom, would they have exchanged the ministry of the gospel of his grace with the crown of righteousness? He who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think had granted them, with the fellowship of his sufferings, the communion of his joy, the joy of bringing many sons unto glory, joy unspeakable, an eternal weight of glory. The Great Controversy, pages 349 and 350. For further reading, The Ministry of Healing, The Discipline of Trial, pages 470 to 473, and Gospel Workers, Personal Ministry, pages 185 to 187.